to Get Real with Estiel, a woman empowerment podcast hosted by Estiel Albaba. Hello and welcome to another episode of Get Real with Estiel. Today is Monday, March 19th, 2018. Super excited to be hosting today's episode, particularly because I have a very, very special guest with me that I interviewed and will be playing the interview on this episode. Her name is Claire Becton, and Claire is an author of Own It, Your Success, Your Future, and Your Life. She's also the author of The Media and the Law in Canada, and she's wrote, written many articles on the Canadian Charters of Rights and Freedom. She's a former professor of law, a senior executive in the Canadian government, and the founder of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Leadership. She's a co-author of A Force to Reckon With, Women Entrepreneurs and Risk, and Everywhere, Everyday, Innovating, Women Entrepreneurs and Innovation. She is a sought-after speaker, mentor, coach, and facilitator. Clear led the developments of and facilities of an advancing women in leadership program at Carleton. She's the recipient of the Fulbright Scholarship and the Litur uh, Fellowship studying at Harvard Kennedy School of Government in 2004 and 5. She's been recognized uh, twice on WXN as one of Canada's 100 most powerful women, along with other recognitions from CWCT, Women of Influence, WPN, and others for her leadership. Claire serves on a number of boards, including Harvard's Women Leadership Board, Chair of Governance Committee at Beechwood National Cemetery, and is a member of the UNICEF's 25th team. She is on the Governance Committee of the IWF Board. She served on the Quincy Carlton Hospital Board as Vice Chair and Chair of the Board. So this is simply an incredible woman with lots of experience across her career and her life and her passions. And I really had such a pleasure talking with her. And I'm sure that you will enjoy the interview uh, that lies ahead of you. So enjoy it. Here it goes. So Claire, thank you so much for joining me on my Get Real with the Seal podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Bright and sunny in Ottawa. Oh, that's lovely. Well, it's sunny here in Toronto as well, but we do have listeners all over the world, so uh, I don't know what conditions they'll be listening uh, this podcast through. But I'm really excited to have this conversation with you because we met in a woman empowerment, um, sorry, a Women's Day event, and you were part of the speaker panels, and and I really loved uh, the energy of all the women there, and I wanted to reach out to you particularly uh, because you have amazing things that you've done. Uh, specifically to help women in the political science and the law uh, field. So let's start with talking about that. Tell me a little bit about what you do and how you got there. Well, what I do now is I'm very passionate about women's leadership and therefore women's empowerment. So I spend my time now doing various things that advance women's leadership, including a course on advancing women in leadership, which I led the development of and now facilitate in through our center at Carleton. I do a lot of um, research, including the one that you heard us talking about, which was around uh, women entrepreneurs and innovation. Yeah. And we also did one on women entrepreneurs and risk. And I do a lot of mentoring and coaching because I really believe in supporting the next generation of women. Absolutely. And I'm able to do this because I had a long career both as a law professor and then as a senior executive in the federal government. And I was able to retire from that in 2009 and uh, basically follow my passion after that. So uh, when you say like the the courses you've designed as far as women in leadership and women entrepreneurship is concerned, why why do you feel that we need um, a specific course catered to women in these particular um, courses versus just a course in leadership that applies for both genders. In other words, what what makes it what makes a woman in leadership different than just a leadership course? I think there's a lot of things that make it different, and one is that women often, when they're on a program with men, don't feel as free to speak up, and they also find that the experiences of the men are different. Women, when they share their stories, they realize they're not alone in some of the challenges that they face every day in the workplace. 
and they're able to work with gaining confidence, getting a better sense of what is that difference, for example, between how men and women communicate and how you can more effectively communicate when you're at a meeting or when you're trying to speak up and really to understand yourself as a leader and as a leader who is a woman. Because we know there's been a lot of barriers or at least challenges Okay. for women to move up to more senior levels in their organizations. So when it comes to these barriers, because I agree with you, I hear this conversation everywhere. Uh, I'm a financial planner, so I, I deal with uh, people in different industries to help them retire. So uh, I hear that word often when I speak to women and their experience with what barrier looked like. But from your experience, what do you think is the most common barriers that we face uh, as far as our progression in the workplace is concerned? I think one of the real challenges right now is there's still unconscious bias okay. out there, and that impacts on the choices that are made, the choices of putting people in certain positions, the choices of who they consider a star in their organization. And when we have a sense of what is a leader, people often think of that as a man, a strong man. And we know that women can present themselves as leaders in many different ways, as can men for that matter. Yeah. But there is this sense of a strong man as that leadership image. So there is that unconscious bias and it can impact the choices. It can impact choices in terms of whether women choose to go into operational areas in an organization and it's often that operational experience that might be missing for them to be able to advance in their organization. Yeah, absolutely. But, and I've also found through the courses that we do that women sometimes hold themselves back by not applying for a position because they think they need to have all 10 of the qualifications when a guy will apply with two or three of them. <laughs> and so someone who's probably far less qualified will then get chosen. Oh, that, I've heard that before. That's very common. Um, and it's interesting to, to understand why that happens. Um, do, do you have potential explanations to why you think this is the case? Well, I think women sometimes think, and I hear this a lot as well, that I just need to have one more course or I just need to have this kind of knowledge because we want to be certain. So we're like perfectionists like, at heart? <laughs> I'm sorry? Like we're, we're almost perfectionists? Well, yes, in many cases that is a fact. There are yeah. women who are perfectionists. And we say perfection is the enemy of the good because Absolutely. if you're spending so much time trying to be a perfectionist, you're probably not putting yourself out there when you need to put yourself out there to move ahead or to do things. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, when you started... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, go, you go ahead. Uh, I was asking, like, when you started with your career as a lawyer, like, at one point did you discover your passion for women empowerment and just helping women in advance in the their careers and ultimately their lives? Like, was there a specific situation that happened or has this always been your passion? So how did it come about in your life? I think it's been a progression because I think I was a feminist at an early age. I grew up with three brothers on a farm. And when I saw that um, my one brother worked hard on the farm and the other two didn't necessarily work on the farm. And when I would see my mother letting them not do chores in the house, but I had to do them all, I felt that wasn't fair. And then, of course, I grew up in the times of the 60s and the 70s when there was massive protests and the rise of the women's movement, the original women's movement. So when I went to law and when I started teaching law, I was very concerned about the fact that there was no women, apart from myself, on the, first, on the faculty where I was teaching, and that there were and seemed to be a number of obstacles preventing women from advancing in their careers. Now, I didn't at that time immediately say I'm going to be working on advancing women, but I was very conscious of the need to be a role model yes. and to be able to be myself as opposed to trying to act like a man as I went up through whatever positions or ranks that I chose to be in. Uh, I love what you just said because I really believe in the power of uh, leading by example. So when you're uh, really 
being a role model, you're embodying the lifestyle and the empowerment that you can have as a woman. Ultimately, people will just follow by by the example you set simply because they they see it in front of their eyes being, um, you know, be happening. And and this for me is huge because I get so inspired when I see a woman like you because, like you said, you are a role model, and ultimately that's the best way to influence society uh, in, in the mass society that is. Well, thank you for that, and uh, I tell women all the time when we do our leadership program that they are role models. Of course. When they're in leadership positions, even if they don't think they are, they are. And that's very important for them to understand because people will be watching them and seeing what they're doing. So if they see them being authentic to themselves, then that will inspire more women to think, well, I can do that and I don't have to try to be something I'm not, because we know how hard that is. Of course. Um, and and it, was that like part of the reason why you ultimately wrote your be- a book, Own It, Your Success, Your Future, Your Life? I wrote the book because I had a lot of experiences, for sure, when I was coming up through uh, both as, as a law professor and then as a executive in the federal government where I ran into a lot of obstacles. And along the way, I began to realize I was the person responsible for my success. And it was only me that could choose and define what I meant by that success because every time I looked around, somebody was promoting something as being a success, but oftentimes it didn't resonate with me or what I aspired to do. So along the way, I I really got interested in leadership and the idea that in our departments, everybody talks about managers, and I said, we need to be leaders. Yes. We need, there's a big difference between being a leader and being a manager because the leader can inspire people to follow them and the manager, for me, management is about managing things and, and uh, maybe financial resources, but not about people. Yeah, managing operations, not necessarily the people for sure. Right, and that's so key because we so often neglect the significance of having people ready to follow you, people who are inspired and who can work as a team because yeah. that's how we get things done. For sure. And and one thing you mentioned earlier that stood out for me is that uh, certain definitions of success didn't resonate with you or you just thought about success differently than what it was portrayed around you. So given the experiences you've been through, what is your definition of success today? Success for me is, did I make a difference? Did what I'm doing have an impact? That's beautiful. And if I if I feel that what I'm doing makes a difference and it has an impact, whether it's on one person or a large number of people, and that will vary by the day, then I feel like I'm a success because I feel that's my purpose is to make get up every day and make that difference. Wonderful, of course. So uh, I love that answer because I think it's so paramount and it's a core value that I share. Uh, so when you reflect on the impact you created, do you, do you have a set time for that? Like, do you reflect uh, on your day on a daily basis or do you do it like once a week or once a month? Like, how often do you just sit back and, and look at the work you're doing and, and what exactly it's impacting? Well, I think I reflect on a regular basis. I wouldn't say that I sit down once a week and reflect, uh, but it just becomes natural because when I'm doing my exercises or I'm out walking, I'll be thinking about things, and we will see what is happening. If I've just spent an hour mentoring someone and I see the light shine in their eyes afterwards, I know I've made a difference and I've made an impact at that point. When I give a talk like I did on the Friday of International Women's Week, and I have people coming up to me and telling me how they were inspired or they shed tears because my story resonated with them and their story. And they were so pleased that someone could actually acknowledge, for example, someone asked me the last time, how do I deal with failure? Like success is one thing, and that's great, but how do you deal with them when things don't go well? And we talked about the emotional part of that. Uh, it's very interesting because that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a great segue, but you're, you're, you're right. How do you deal with failure? And do you think, um, well, first of all, let's start with how you personally deal with it. And if you can mention... Uh, like examples of certain failures you've been through if you'd like uh, but also later if you want to talk about the difference of how women in general deal with failure versus their uh, male counterparts right 
Well, I first of all, I don't think there's such a thing as failure except to give up. So I like to think of them as setbacks or breakdowns okay. that we run into all of the time when something doesn't work out the way that we think it should or someone says something to us which we're really not happy about and we feel really bad about it. So that to me is a, is a setback, but it's not a failure. For example, years ago, one of the examples that I have is I was a new manager and not yet a leader, and my boss said to me that everybody hated me and they all wanted to quit. Now, I was shocked, but not surprised in one sense because he had already told that to another woman and basically destroyed her. But I said, prove it. And so he did his canvassing of all of the people in my area, and he came back and said, well, there's this problem and that problem. And I said, yes, I know that. So I took it. I could have been really defeated, but I decided that I wasn't going to let that happen. Wow. And so I got someone to mentor me who was a role model for me, one of the only senior women in the organization, and used that to propel myself forward. But what I've learned over the years is you need to deal with the emotional side of it because we, women tend to ruminate. We tend to go over and over things that have happened and probably make it sound far worse than it is at the end of the day. Yes. But what I've learned to do is I can go home and have my cry or my emotional meltdown, whatever it's going to be. But now I give myself far less time to do that. I might now say, okay, you're allowed to have an hour or two hours, and then now what are you going to do about it? Yes. So really to focus on what happened, what was my part in it, and now what am I going to do about it? Because when you set a plan and you take steps to do something, you feel so much better and so much stronger. Absolutely, and I feel like that gives structure to our emotions because prior to that plan, it's not tangible. Like Emotions in general are so abstract and sometimes really hard to understand but when you break it down the way you did um like what happened how can i move on from this what are the next steps these are really things that are concrete and and it really comes that calms us down because it brings uh like it, it brings life to whatever it is we're dealing with it brings the structure to move forward with so i really like that it's, it's a very good uh you know feedback to to for listeners especially those who feel that they deal with lots of emotions from their work, uh, to have that structure to move away from it is, is really helpful, I think. And I, I think it's really important. It's also good for solving difficult challenges or for problems or for when you get bad news, such as, for example, you get a cancer diagnosis or a diagnosis of an illness. Yeah. That can really set someone back. But the way that you, you can look at it is say, what do I have control over? And that's really what essentially we're talking about here is what do I have control over and therefore within that those parameters, yes. what can I do Absolutely. to help me? And that immediately gives us a place to start from. Hmm. Absolutely. So I, I can see how that would play very well when we do have answers and, and, and understand exactly what the next steps are. But in times where we lose sight of what we should be doing and, and potentially our motivation dwindles, um, are there certain things in your life that you've uh, came across or just uh, pr practiced to keep yourself motivated and just keep yourself going when times it gets really tough? I think what is really important is if you understand the purpose, your purpose and why you're doing things, so that if you have bad days or if you have days when things aren't working out so well or even weeks of when things aren't working so well, you can go back to that core and say, what is it that I'm about? What is it that drives me to get up every morning and what's happened that I don't have that at the moment? So you really need to go back and dig deep in yourself and say, if I'm really motivated or was motivated to do something. Why am I no longer motivated? What's missing? What do I need to do to get that back? And sometimes it may be changing a role. For example, if you're in a really bad situation, yeah. as I did in my last role in government, I found I was not being the person I wanted to be. I decided I had to leave. And once I left, then I could dig deep again and find out 
what I, where I was going to go at that point. But sometimes you have to make tough decisions to get out of where you Absolutely. are. Absolutely. And I understand that different positions you've held probably had different purposes for you. But is there an underlying theme to why you did it? Or uh, like a, a theme of, in general, what careers you pursued? Well, I think that I've always wanted to make a difference from the time I was young. And one of the, th the differences I wanted to make, quite frankly, is I saw power being exercised in my small town by a group of people. And they were men, and of course the families around them. My family came from what I would call the wrong side of the tracks. We were poor, we lived in a three-room shack, we had no running water, we had no electricity. So I was really, when I looked at that power dynamics, and at a young age, I said, that's not how power should be exercised. Yes. So I felt very strongly that law as a career was going to help me access power so I could demonstrate in a, how power could be used in a good way to make a difference and not be used as the power over people, but the power to make things happen. Absolutely. And I've always felt that way and still do, because I think whether it's your personal power or it's a positional power, how you exercise it can make such a difference. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Some uh, The misuse of power is, is devastating sometimes because we look up to people in power and we're, we're very much influenced to people in power. So. Uh, we need people in power for the right reasons, ultimately. And, and it's so important for people to have these values along the way. Because often what happens is people lose sight of who they are and why they even wanted power to begin with along their journey to obtain it. So it's wonderful to see that, um, you know, there could be a balance to strike to power and service go hand in hand. It's, it's really wonderful to see that. I think that is exactly what power is about. It is about service. It is not for personal aggrandization and or to, to obtain money or any of these things. That's not to say that you shouldn't have money because of course you should. Yeah. But in terms of power, and I think we shouldn't limit power to people in positions of power. There are people who are very powerful because they have influence whether they sit in a position or not. I think you can think of Nelson Mandela before he became a leader in a political party in South Africa. He had tremendous power because sure. he had influence. He could influence people. Sure. And the same with Gandhi in India before he became a political leader. He had tremendous influence. And that's a power as well. It's not only a position where you sit in it like the President of the United States. It's the office that really has the power. Sure. The person who's in it has a responsibility to exercise it in a good way, which we know doesn't always happen. Absolutely. Uh, and I love how you mentioned influence because ultimately that's what power is, your ability to po like hopefully positively influence those around you. Now, when you think about um, women in power, whether it's role models you looked up to or the students you've mentored or women in your workforce, uh, were there specific common traits of women in power that you think are helpful for somebody to learn or obtain to become uh, in that to become in that position? Well, I think we can't assume that every woman who's in a position of power or authority will use their power effectively. That's obviously we know that yeah. both women and men. Absolutely, and absolutely. But I'm talking more about the traits. I'm sorry? I was referring to the traits that you think would be common for them to, uh, like from the from your observation, common traits of women in power. Yes, well, that's what I was moving towards is that when you look at the women who are truly exercising their power in a way that is in service to others, you will see them caring about the people that they work for, that creating an environment of trust amongst their teams and their followers, that they will respect those followers, they will treat them equitably, mm -hmm. and that they will not abuse that power in any way by appropriating things for themselves or mistreating other people. I think those are really important elements which can be for a man or a woman. I would say the same thing about a man. I really don't see a difference okay. in terms of 
the, the proper and effective use of power. But with women, you want them to be authentic, obviously. You want them to be acting and bringing their whole selves to the exercise of that power so that it's how the expression of who I am, not an imitation of what I've seen from somewhere else. Um, th- this may be a little bit of a, an odd question, but has there been a time in your career where your power and ability to influence became uncomfortable either to you or to people around you just because it was uh, something you exuded? Well, I don't think so. I mean, I've, I've n- all, never tried to make it uncomfortable for people around me, certainly in my last role in government. It was very difficult for me to exercise the authority and power I had in my position because I had a minister who was not supporting me. And basically, that hurt my team. So in that sense, yes, it was something that I did not find very satisfactory, obviously, yeah. because I couldn't achieve what I set out to achieve. And for me... Being able to achieve that and being able to treat people in the way that I want them to be treated is so important to me. And so when I have to live around someone who's being abusive, that can be very hard. Oh, absolutely. Uh, It's really tough. And I feel like setting boundaries um, in both professional and personal lives are so important. So especially when we're dealing with somebody abusive, uh, it's so crucial to set boundaries to what's acceptable and what's not. Has there been any times where you had to uh, really go out of your way to set certain boundaries? There have been times when it's important to set boundaries. In the circumstances in which I described, it was very difficult because the person had power above me and um, was not very receptive Mm -hmm. to hearing about how they were behaving. So that becomes very difficult, but yes, it does, and I certainly now am very ready to say to someone, I don't find acceptable your behavior if they're acting in an abusive way. I don't think any of us should accept that kind of abuse. Sometimes it may be difficult to change the circumstances and the person may not respond in the way that you want them, so sometimes you have to leave that situation. Of course. There may not be any other choices but to leave and find yourself in another situation or place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is there like certain habits that you cultivated along your journey to help you uh, with your focus on productivity and, and general habits that you think are important for success in general? Yes, I would say there are some. And one is I always try to keep my eye on the destination. Where is it that I want to get to? If, for example, when I was a leader, for example, I call that leading with vision, where you need to be thinking about, we need to achieve something, we need to arrive somewhere. So every day, when we set out to determine what we're going to do, we have to ask ourselves, is that something that's going to advance us towards that goal? Or is it something that's going to distract us from that goal? Yes. And so that, that was something that was really important for me in leading uh, large portions of organizations and an organization because it's so easy and I've seen that happen so often. People get distracted yes. by the little things, by the urgent that aren't important. Yes. And so keeping your eye firmly on that, what is important, creating a network. I, I've learned over the years how important it is to have a network and to have a strong network because We need other people, both to support us, but people we can call upon who can assist us when we encounter challenges or when we need information that might take us a long time to find. And for example, we can call someone else or email them and can quickly obtain that information. It also allows us to connect people. And connection is something that I find extremely important in this world, is being able to connect people and be connected yourself. And one other thing that I think is really important is to be a continuous learner. And I'm a constant learner. I'm always trying to understand what's going on around me, what are the key things that are happening, and how do I need to be a part of that? What do I need to do to be able to keep in touch with what is important in the world right now and and for me in my life and my work and what I'm doing? 
I love that you just said that because I speak a lot about these topics in my podcast. And there's this Japanese word actually called kaizen. I'm not sure if you've heard of it before, but the word itself means never ending and constant development. Uh, and, and there's no equivalent of that in English where it's just one word that embodies that lifestyle. But it's, I, I feel like it's so crucial for us to continuously be on that road, looking to grow in every single aspect of our life. And the more we grow, the more we have the ability to impact. So um, like to summarize what you said, keeping your eye on destination, uh, creating a strong network and connections, uh, which helps with your support system and, and being a continuous learner. These are absolutely great takeaways uh, that I'm sure helped you and, and will help the listeners too. Uh, so thank you for sharing them. Oh, I'm more than happy to show them. The other thing is, you, know, you have to be prepared to work hard if you really want something. Yes. I have always been prepared to work hard and to get back up again if I get knocked down because I think that's so important. We can't let that fear or that setback keep us on the ground because if we do, we will be very unhappy and we won't make progress. We won't achieve that success, whatever it is in our mind. It's very interesting uh, segue to my next question, actually, because working hard is absolutely fundamental in anything we do. But we also, um, like a lot of women, strive for a work-life balance. And sometimes when you're ultimately working super hard at the career you have or the projects you have and you're just a go-getter, sometimes that balance is really, really difficult to maintain. So ha has there been periods in your life where you experienced that or frustrations with the work-life balance? And like, what are some tips that you can give women who are ambitious and go-getters, but at the same time uh, want a family and, and seek that balance? Because it's really hard, I think. Well, first of all, I don't like the term balance because I don't think it exists. Okay. <laughs> I like the word work-life integration because it's ah. all integrated. We don't have separate lives. It all flows in together. And so I think it is all about priorities. I love that. In your life. And that can change from time period to time period. When my children were young, for example, any volunteering I did would be aligned with whatever activities they were involved in so what the time I had to spend with them was more than it would be if I was off doing some volunteer work that didn't involve them. Makes sense. And secondly, I said, well, when I get, when my children are grown, then I will have time to do a lot more volunteering, which I do now. So, and it is also accepting that maybe your house isn't going to be perfect or maybe whatever dollars I can spare, I will use them to have someone to clean my house or someone to make sure dinner arrives or I purchase prepaid, prepared meals for those three or four days when work and family life just don't allow me to spend a lot of time or my spouse to spend a lot of time cooking that meal. So it's really looking at what are your priorities. When we were doing our research around women entrepreneurs, one of the things that we heard from a number of them were when my children were really small, I didn't necessarily grow my business as fast. Once my children got older, then I could put the full burners on my business. Now, that's not every case, but there were a number yes. of people that did that. But it's also important when you have this is to look around and say, who are my supporters? Yeah. How do I partner if we have children? How do I partner with my spouse in a way that ensures we both can achieve all of our goals? Yes. And are there other people who can support and help us? I know with my own ch ch children, my oldest son has a two-year-old, and so we're often going four hours away to help them out or them coming here with our granddaughters so we can help them out. So these are the kind of things I think we need to have as part of our thinking when we think about that work-life integration. But if you want balance and you think about it like the scales of justice, that doesn't exist. It's over a lifetime where you think, do I feel good inside about what I'm doing? Or do I spend my life feeling guilty when I'm at work because I'm not with my children and when I'm with my children feel guilty because I'm not at work? That doesn't make us very healthy. Of course, it doesn't. And, and I think we just need to say, what are our priorities? And recognize that they're going to change with time and that there are going to be times in our lives, which I call the busy years, when you may not have a lot of time to do other things that you might like to do, but think, well, I'll put those off for a while. And then later on, 
when things change and you have that more of that free time for yourself, you can do some of those things. Yes. Which is why keeping your eye on destination, which is what you mentioned earlier, is important because because that is what keeps you going in, in times where it's really hard to juggle everything. Yes, and uh, and juggling is, uh, as you say, trying to find other people who can help you, not being afraid to ask for help because a lot of women won't ask for help, and that's a big mistake. Ask for all the help you need. Don't be afraid to ask for help because that's another way that you can get things done. Yes. Like sometimes, for example, you might have someone who you say, can you do the carpool tonight even though I was supposed to, and I will do the next two next week because I have a, a special thing I have to do at work. And these are all things we kind of negotiate. Yes. Where we want to be and what's important in our life at that particular time. That's not saying it's easy. I mean, it's challenging if you want to have a demanding career in a family. It's definitely challenging. But would I say it's worth it? I absolutely feel it's worth it because I've been able to feel good on both fronts. I agree. And I think it's a practice. Like once you set out to start asking and speaking up for what you want and asking for the things that you want, it just becomes integrated in your lifestyle and ultimately becomes second nature. Like first you started with a conscious effort, but eventually as long as you're being um, like obviously assertive, but also uh, reasonable, like it, it, it's just something you start appreciating about yourself to be able to ask for what you want. And that ultimately helps you in the workplace when you want to have, a, when you want to ask for a raise or a promotion or whatever it is that you, that you want. I think women generally need to learn that, that skill in general. Yes, and I think it starts with knowing what you really want. Absolutely. And understanding what you really want and, and what you want to achieve and how much it'll cost you in terms of your well-being if you don't do it. Because many people will say, I'm, I'm scared to take that risk but they, because it might, this might happen or that might happen. But what they fail to think about is if I don't take it, what yes. is it costing me as well? Because I won't have achieved what I set out to achieve. I may, looking back years later, saying I really regret that I didn't do that. And you want to arrive at that later as you go on in life. Yeah. You want to be able to say I don't have any regrets for things I didn't do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another version of what success is, to just have that sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. Yes, and it doesn't mean we necessarily get to do everything we want. But I think if we get to do enough of the things that matter, that's what's really important in our life. Which is um, really interesting because it takes me to the next question. You've had absolutely a very rich career. You've, uh, you're still mentoring and you're still doing a lot of work in your community. And now you recently co uh, uh, authored a book. So what's next for you? Well, I'm continuing to work on advancing women's leadership and however that turns out. You know, there's a lot of new ideas generating with my uh, research partner and some other things that I have in mind. So right now I'm at that stage of what I call the generational stage when I'm generating new possibilities that are coming out of the things that we've done. And so maybe a year from now or two years from now, I'll be going in a slightly different or maybe a radical different direction in terms of, but still with the goal of advancing women's leadership. Because when I started and I founded my center, the original center in 2010, I didn't really have an end in mind, meaning a sense of, okay, it has to be this way or it has to be that way. It's going to be organic in its growth, and that's the way it's been. It's changed, it's morphed and merged the center. I started off doing research, for example, around uh, benchmark study of women's leadership. We've looked at women in politics, at women in mining, at women in the public service, and then I excuse me, teamed up with my partner in the research, Janice McDonald, and we've done two major pieces of work around women entrepreneurs, which was not in my mind when I started the center in 2010. So as long as you're open, you never know where this is going to morph into, and I'm always open to the possibilities that are happening around me. Absolutely. There, I recently came across this um, movement on LinkedIn, a, a woman in the aerospace, uh, and she realized there's not enough women in this field. 
And there was this hashtag that, that she started, uh, sky is no longer the limit. And I thought that was really clever. Um, and, and it's interesting when different women just spread across different industries, like some of the ones that you mentioned, whether it's mining or uh, just general fields that there's not enough women in. And, and for them to then recognize the gaps, because we offer a different skill set altogether, regardless which industry we're talking about, and for them to just start these movements and, and encourage women and em- embrace the other skills that we can bring to whatever industry we join. Uh, I, yes, I, th- I think every industry needs those different perspectives Absolutely. that women will bring to the table, but also because women are 50% of the population. 100%. I think women have been conditioned to stay away from science and math inadvertently through how it's taught in the schools, how teachers have encouraged or not encouraged girls and boys yes. to follow those scientific directions or the mathematical directions, and then what women find when they get into the workplace because the workplaces haven't changed so you go through engineering and I've talked to so many women engineers and then they get into the workplace and it's very very difficult to be a woman in a traditionally male dominated workplace especially if there's not enough of you yes to begin to make that difference and even in the in the schools in certain types of engineering for example there are very few women in others there are a lot more But we definitely need women to think in the direction of science, technology, because there's so many jobs and they're good jobs and they're higher paying jobs in a lot of these areas. And women lose out when Uh, they're not there. um, I'm in the. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with any of the areas that women are in, but we need to expand our horizons. Absolutely. And there are some countries where women are very much encouraged to go into science and engineering and math. And we can learn in every country, you can learn from each other in terms of how we do encourage our women to do that. It's interesting because I'm in the financial planning field. Um, so recently there was a study by the CFP or, or um, accreditation, which is Certified Financial Planner, and there's still 70% uh, to 30% ratio uh, men over women uh, in this field. And I, it was shocking to me because I thought like we've we've come a long way in advancing in, in financial um, accreditations and specifically financial planning, but there's still a lack of of that, uh, you know, it's. I, I didn't realize the gap is still as big as it was. So I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, I think you find that when you get into some areas, you think, well, there should have been major change. We've been at this a long time. And there has been significant change in a num- number of areas, but numbers alone hasn't changed the dynamic that was there before, and we saw that because when I was going to law school, we were less than 12% of the class that I went through. By the time I started teaching law, it had morphed to over a third, and in some areas, by the time I left teaching, over half. And so we expected that would automatically result in uh, half the judges and half the senior partners in law firm being women, but that hasn't happened. Wow, interesting. Yeah, I, I I meet a lot of women who were lawyers but never actually uh, pursued the career, even though they graduated. Uh, and and a lot of them would like I've recently had this conversation with at least a handful. Uh, it was like a, a reunion in a law firm of some sort, and they were just mentioning the difficulty they've had with the work life balance, and they just chose different paths after that but if, I, I, I'm not sure I don't know much about the field but I obviously know how much strain it can have on someone's balance but we talked about that earlier and you said it's really just about integration and letting go of that perfectionism as far as balance is concerned well I, I think it's making the choices like for example uh, some women chose to work for government and work for the Department of Justice for example because it's much easier to have the kind of life that they would like to have. There are another a number of women starting their own law firms or joining law firms run by women because they can set the working environment the way it best suits them and the reality of their lives yes. instead of ascribing to the traditional partnership model that still exists in a lot of firms. Absolutely. 
Um, so I want to be mindful of your time because we can sit here and talk for about so many things. It's very exciting for me to hear about these topics because I'm passionate about them like you are. Um, but um, for the sake of time, is there anything you would like to share uh, with the li listeners as last thoughts or advice for women or just society in general? I think one of the really important things is to really decide what you want to do in your life and go after it and dream dream big this is one of the things that we often don't do enough of is really dream and about what we can accomplish and then set out to do it we may not achieve that full big dream but the bigger we dream the more likely we're to achieve more absolutely and i always really found it interesting when richard branson was asked what he would do differently if he was to start all over again he said i would dream bigger and anyone who knows Richard Branson of and course. the empire he has, he dreamed plenty big as it was. Such an interesting, I never heard of that answer uh, from him, but that's a great uh, thing to reflect on coming from a, a person like him. Is there anything you would do differently? I think we would all, if we looked back, we would probably all do certain things differently. I think I might have um, done more yeah. than I've done. You know, I think I've done lots, but you know, I might have done more even if I had had the information that I have now. But I guess that, that's part of life. That's the journey of, course. of life. In hindsight. It, the important thing is that I'm not stopping now because I know I realize that I have a lot to still bring to the table. And you're sort of acquired as you get older. You have more confidence. You have less fear about what may or may not happen. And so you're really freed up to continue to make that difference. And I'd rather do that than pursue hobbies, quite frankly. Yes, absolutely. So, so Personally, I'm on the same that. page uh, because it, it just gives you so much fulfillment. And when you're doing something you love, it is it is sort of like a hobby anyways. Um, so for me, it's much more than a hobby. For me, it's a passion. It's a calling. It's something that I really, really find value in doing and I would rather be doing that than quote retiring makes sense I when I speak to my clients about retirement I always bring this up that retirement is not necessarily uh, stopping working it's transitioning your work into something else and it could be reinventing a whole different career or a path and a lot of people are going more and more into that because you need a stimulation on every level to to, to like to grow is to live like you there's no way you can be living if you're not growing and ultimately contributing and that's what gives you uh passion and ultimately fuels you to keep going so i feel that this is so important to a uh, conversation when i speak to uh, uh, you know retirees or people about to retire about how that transition looks like yes and i think more than anything if you didn't have the opportunity to fully indulge your passion Yes. When you were working and in the careers that you had, or you were afraid to then because you, your family depended upon you, if you have that freedom now, you can really say, I'm going to indulge completely in the passions that I have and really see what I can do with those without those constraints that I might have had when I had kids who were depending on me, for example. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. You have a lot of insight to offer, and I'm sure that the listeners and anyone who you know comes across your work or your teachings or even have the pleasure to be mentored by you can benefit so much from the journey you've had because you truly are a role model. And, and I really want to just acknowledge you for all the work you've done and just all the inspiration you continue to do today to everybody around you. So thank you so much, Claire. It's been such a pleasure to host you on my podcast. Um, and, and thank you. It's, you know, it's um, been lovely to spend the hour talking to you. So that was it, folks. I hope you found so much inspiration in the uh, words of Claire because she clearly lived a life of passion and fulfillment. And this is now your duty to, uh, you know, lead by example as well because the world is watching. Your kids are watching. Your neighbors are watching. Society in general is watching. And our duty is to leave this world in a better place than we what we found it as. So I really hope that you find your passion and you live it in every way you can 
one. And I'm always interested to hear your story. If you have anything you'd like to share with me, feel free to shoot me a message. Uh, you can reach me at uh, my Instagram or social media at Astiel Baba. So I look forward to hearing from you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.